Through the Bloodline, the struggle continues. The Bloodline of Combat Skin Lion in Arcanite is a rather interesting case, in the sense that while the other skin brands are generally for fashion purposes rather than actual practical combat use, with some exceptions, the BOC series stands out by essentially showing what the depicted operator is like in the future or in their prime, i.e. Unectus takes over the RY engineering department and basically power creeps closure. Plus, unlike certain skins released as tie-ins for certain events, such as Liskarm and Schwartz for Originium Dust or Elysium for Ideal City, the BOC skins for Lapland, Saria, Beagle, and Ebonholz would show up later on in their dedicated side stories, especially in the case of Beagle's skin, being alluded to indirectly in Who Is Real's story, the very same story that revealed Cruz and Lava's altars, essentially reinforcing the idea that the BOC skins are somewhat pseudo-altars. So the theory I want to present then is, since these four operators have BOC skins that directly show up in their own side stories, then will other operators wearing these skins show up as well in future stories wearing their BOC outfits? Is the Bloodland of Combat skin series foreshadowing? Now this kind of sounds like a stretch. We may only have four operators to back up this claim, but it's enough to form the basis of this theory. And considering the nature of this specific brand regarding its lore implications, the theory is definitely plausible for some ops, but likely not a guarantee for all of them. The only character whom this theory does not apply to though is Executor, whom already has his own altar and is the only real hole in this theory. By extension, I would reckon that the BOC skins for Scotty the Corrupting Heart and Orchid are partial halls as well. Scotty the Corrupting Heart and her story are of dubious canonicity at best, while Orchid's BOC skin is merely in reference to her operator record, where she laments how she failed to design a wedding dress to a man's dying fiancé. Everyone else, however, is essentially fair game for speculation. Now just as a heads up, I am no lore master for Arknights. There's simply a fuck ton of characters and a fuck ton of side stories that they simply just do not have the time to read and understand them all. I can only speculate from what information I could pull from the Arcanite's tarot wiki, as well as prior knowledge that I either learned in-game or from other Arcanite's lore channels. I'm just one guy with limited knowledge. Please, if there's any dedicated Arcanite's lore heads slash lore focus, or Vorthos if you're a Magic the Gathering nerd, then feel free to add on to this theory or make your own video with your own take on this especially for the characters with BOC skins whom I did not go over. I want to encourage more lore-based content for the Arknights community, and especially for its lore-focused slash Vorthos players. And I believe that open speculations and analysis like this are a good springboard for additional discussion, and especially for more diversity for Arknights' Ian content creation space, beyond the status quo of the type of content that we normally see. Now, with that out of the way, I'm going to go over the BOC operators that I at least have confident knowledge on to perform speculation and give my thoughts and analysis on, starting with the lowest rarities first and working our way up. Oh yeah, and I'm going to be mentioning a lot of story spoilers by the way, so be wary of that. Lancet 2. Shore Rescue Modification. I couldn't perform any task while I was afloat, so the only thing I could do was compute something interesting. According to my calculations over these last 3 months, the logic of space and time takes the form of the lovely Miss Closure. Lancet 2 was unexpectedly shot down into the water while aiding Aegi refugees off the coast of Iberia, and remained afloat for 3 months until located and retrieved by a Rose Island search and rescue team. Now regarding the context and situation of this one, while I have not actually read on the Seaborn Intermezzi stories, I do find it intriguing that they would be that of Intermezzi significance implying that the seaboard hold a major lore significance to the likes of that of Calcet, Babel, and the Doctor. The two most recent intermessi we got, Lone Trail and Babel, have given us huge lore drops regarding the Doctor, about who they are, and their background. The latter of the two stories I will go over in greater detail much later. So far, 
Lone Trail, Path of Life, and Mizuki's lore have revealed to us that Doc's race created the Seaborn as terraforming organisms intended to revitalize the planet. But their project was ultimately thwarted as a result of a calamity from the sky that nearly wiped out the civilization, prompting the creation of the Preserver Project in the process. The Seaborn then turned antagonistic as a result of the Aegir. While the underwater ruins were originally laboratories intended to experiment on and create these life forms, I believe that Act 3, if nothing else, is 100% going to touch bases on those aspects, whether just the Seaborn or the grand scope of the consequences as a result of Doc's civilization, or perhaps the former leads into the latter. And regarding Lancet's situation of attempting to aid Aegir refugees off the Iberian coast signifies that something dire has happened there that would warrant mass evacuations and the refugee crisis to boot. Most definitely, a seaborne outbreak or invasion. Mizuki and K. Willa Arbor, while obviously non-canon and is essentially a Marvel what-if story, does go into detail about how the Seaborn invasion has completely wiped out all of Terra as a result of Scotty awakening Primal Kyogre within her blood, with Calcid of all people establishing a last bastion of humanity to fight back against this Seaborn threat. In fact, in the Discover Terra YouTube video, it mentions the Seaborn threat, as well as how the nation of Aegir has broadcast a signal to all of Terra, asking all of humanity to set aside their differences and fight against the looming Seaborn threat, united under the leadership of Aegir to overcome them together. To wrap this yapping back around to Lancet, this would signify that the looming Seaborn invasion that Aegir has warned and broadcasted about has already begun. With Iberia being hit the worst as told with its implied refugee crisis, Plus, it would signify that Act 3 would begin with this invasion, likely exponentially growing as it threatens to consume all of Terra. Similar to how the Sarcast tyranny in Londinium has threatened to wipe out all of Terra in wake of the recess's revenge-induced genocide and nationalism, with Londinium being the epicenter and being hit the worst, as that was the recess's base of operations. Midnight, Seventh Nights Awakened Spot, Professional. I've decided to compress Midnight and Spot into the same segment as they both take place in the same situation. In both, they are filming an Annihilation Mission promo video addressing some sort of director woman. In Midnight's skin description, his quote has him attempting to flirt with the director only to get smacked in the face as a result. The flavor text mentioning how everyone involved on set agreed that Midnight's display was over the top. For Spot, he seems to be losing his patience with the director, as the flavor text mentioned how Spot was thinking about what cartoons were on tonight. While this isn't as huge in its lore implications as much as a yap for Lancet 2, it does imply the basis for what would be the altars for Midnight and Spot. Not to mention, fellow 3-star operator Lava had her altar introduced in a similar manner. In Ancient Forge, Nian directed a movie that had Lava star in it while wearing a costume, which would later become Love of the Purgatory. So then, this would somewhat imply that the director woman that the two Team A6 members are addressing would be none other than Nian herself. It would certainly follow in the trend of how Lava's altar was introduced, that being it originated from a screenplay. So I have no doubt that something similar will happen regarding Midnight in Spot's altars. Speaking of three stars and their altars, Beagle, Dreadnought. I know I've briefly mentioned Beagle in the intro, well, I want to touch base more on her BOC skin here. To start off with, the skin is indirectly referenced in Who Is Real, when Dusk traps Cruz in a dreamlike world implied to be constructed from her memories. In other words, all in the head. Her quote, I knew you'd be here, sorry, but I won't let you pass, no matter what, is quoted verbatim in the cutscene, where Cruz is then taken to a situation where Rose Island is retreating from an ambiguous conflict, while Cruz is lamenting leaving Beagle to her unspecified demise. That's the most we see Beagle mentioned in this cutscene before Nian steps in and changes the scene. In the flavor text, it describes Beagle to be an elite operator stationed at the Great March of Bolivar, in which this appears to be her final test. The wording of final test is odd at first though. Like, what exactly is Beagle being tested on? If she went from a rookie operator to an elite, then there would be no more need to undergo any tests, 
Unless, however, this is a test of willpower or something similar. Where this is the first time Biko is deployed into a serious conflict after being promoted to elite operator status. A test to show her maturity, but will likely leave her, and by extension, Cruz and Lava, as implied by the operator files telling us how they have PTSD and survivor guilt of an undisclosed and redacted event, seriously traumatized and changed as a person. Now, there's some more pieces of lore connecting to the skin than what other people may think. In an old theory video by Kaiser MLG that covers Beagle's BOC skin and her appearance in Who is Real, he speculates that the person Beagle is confronting is Doberman, knowing how the latter has roots in Bolivar as a military colonel and has stated in her stories of afternoon cutscene that she would like to return there someday. Which is why the flavor text states this confrontation between her old mentor to be your final test, and why Beagle says the quote as if she recognizes the person she's confronting. Now in the theory though, he speculates that Doberman killed Beagle in their confrontation. However, Fang the Fire Sharpen debunks her death, as her files confirm Beagle to be alive, at the best anyway. So then, if not killed, then at least seriously injured and mentally scarred otherwise as a result of the confrontation. Now, as plausible as this theory sounds, I am pretty skeptical regarding Doberman defecting Rhodes Island and essentially killing or grievously wounding one of her former students. Plus, Doberman basically defected the army because she saw them as corrupt, a system that viewed soldiers as mindless obedient machines instead of real humans and ended up joining Rhodes Island because she respected their conviction and ideals a lot more than the factions she served in. While Doberman herself stated that she does want to go back, her reasons for deserting the army discredit the notion of any means of joining the warring factions again. And as for the fact she would kill Beagle, well, Doberman herself deeply respects and cares about her students despite the cold exterior she puts on. So, unless Doberman has a character arc where she has an eternal conflict about where her true loyalty lies, whether in Bolivar or Rhodes Island, then I seriously don't see Doberman following through with this sort of thing. Besides, the information we are presented with via her archive files discredit a lot of this theory. As a career military woman, Doberman is heavily on discipline. There are many strict rules under her training regimen and no transgression or violation is tolerated, which has put off many operators. At the same time, however, Doberman cares about each operator's diet, physical condition, and even emotional state. She has never forced anyone to do more than what they were capable of doing. It's just that her commitment is a bit too subtle. Naturally, this stems from Doberman's inability to properly express herself. Hopefully, more people will come to understand her. Then again, the conflict that Beagle is stationed in is the Bolivar Civil War, a conflict that has been mentioned a lot but has yet to be actually experienced firsthand. We know that as of recently, in Come Catastrophes and Wakes of Vultures, Blacksteel CEO Clip Cliff acquired the Davistown plate and has plans on repurposing it into a training facility to prepare for the conflicts in Bolivar. Plus, in Operation Originium Dust, it tells us that Franca and Liskarm have pretty much resigned from Blacksteel and are now full-fledged Rhodes Island operators. In addition, we also know that from Calm Catastrophes that Jessica has resigned, or at least abandoned Blacksteel, following the events that went down in Davistown, as well as Blacksteel's complicity in the whole thing. So if that's what caused Jessica to resign from Blacksteel, then could it be the PMC company's actions in Boulevard that caused Franca and Liskarm to resign as well? If we are not going by the fact that Beagle confronted Doberman, then could it likely be a Black Steel operator instead? Of course, Beagle has zero established relationship with Black Steel, nor its members that would otherwise provoke her saying, I knew you'd be here, implying a sense of familiarity. It's possible she doesn't even know who Franca, Liskarm, or Clip even are. But wait, if not those three, then who else but fellow 3 star operator Vanilla? We have yet to see Vanilla in an in game Black Steel story and it was a huge missed opportunity to put her in Jessica's dedicated side story. Instead, we get fucking Almond. Like, bro, does anybody even remember Almond? Also, her status as Blacksteel trainee and rookie operator would at least suggest some sort of prior relationship with her and Beagle, as well as the other three-star operators. Not to mention, 
In one of the stories of afternoon cutscenes, we directly see Vanilla interacting with Melantha and Stewart of Reserve Team A4, with a conversation in particular stating how Franca took note of Melantha's swordsmanship, applied for her to join her team, and taught her sword techniques in the process. Melantha noted how much of a good influence Franca was on her swordsmanship, with Vanilla replying how glad she is to know of how good of a teacher she is, despite her eccentric personality. Noting how unmatched her swordsmanship is among the folks in Blacksteel, both Melantha and Franca's operator records confirm the student-teacher relationship between them. Plus, she's the only other 3-star op and reserve team member besides Vanilla that Franca and Liskram actually interacted and have an established relationship with. So, by extension, Vanilla's connection to Team A4 would suggest she is also friends with the members of Teams A6 and A1, respectively. That's the only other candidate whom I believe is likely to show up to confront Beagle in their skin. Not to mention, this piece of art made for the 5th anniversary and likely approved by Hypergriff shows all of the 3-star altars depicted alongside Beagle in their BOC skin, meaning that Beagle altar is practically a guarantee now. It's only a matter of when they release it. Shirayuki, Wind of Breaking Blade we see Shibayuki serving the Higashi military under the orders of the Southern Court, getting ready to confront and execute a general serving the Northern Court. In Higashi, the nation consists of a North and Southern Court that are in conflict with each other. In the past, the two courts fought in a civil war that seriously devastated the country, only having tensions eased with each other following the Blood Peak campaign in which the two courts had to form an alliance to repel the invading Ursus army from Higashi. In the modern day, the two courts are split into their own territories that are slowly beginning to tolerate each other under a post-war period after the Blood Peak campaign, known as the Recovering 20 Years. Based on Higashi's history, the enemy set instead of taking place in the future, we look into the past and see Shirayuki during her prime as an assassin under Higashi's southern court during the Civil War. It also subtly paints a timeline regarding her story outside of what little is provided to us from her files. Considering the time proximity from the conflicts in Higashi to Arc Knight's main story, that is, the Higashi Civil War lasted 300 years, the Blood Peak campaign that forced Higashi to unite was in 1072, the Chernobog Lungman Crisis that kickstarted the main story was in 1097 and Shirayuki joins Rose Island as a part of their alliance with Lugman soon after it starts. Making it at least a 20 year difference between those events, then it means that this was nearing the end of the civil war with a relatively younger version of Shirayuki, likely before the Ursa's invasion took place that forced the country to unite, explaining why she's confronting a northern court general and by extension, provided by her module story, fought against Fumizuki following the Southern Court's purge of her family, swearing loyalty to the princess after she defeated her in a confrontation. Frostleaf, Breaking the Ice We see that Frostleaf is undergoing a rescue mission in Colombia's north, questioning the fact that the country still utilizes child soldiers before departing. In Frostleaf's story, she grew up and was raised on the battlefield as a child soldier and a mercenary. Her archive files tell us that, for all her life, she had known nothing but war up until she joined Rhodes Island, in which her operator record shows us how she would adapt to a lifestyle outside of conflict. That is, she's illiterate and doesn't really seem to be getting along with the other RY operators. It's only then where she's received several gifts, one of them a pair of headphones and a vocabulary book, does she end up overcoming her illiteracy by understanding the lyrics, and soon adjusting to this new lifestyle, befriending the members of Reserve Op Team A1 and Perfumer in the process. So regarding her background, it means that comment on child soldiers and the flavor text, life has bestowed her the resolve to return to the battlefield, means that Frostleaf has not only learned to settle down and appreciate life as shown in her operator record, but has also renewed her conviction thanks to her friends. Plus, it's likely this rescue mission she's undergoing is to save those child soldiers, possibly to give them a new chance at life and bring them aboard Rhodes Island, a lifestyle away from war, a second chance that she herself had gotten when being brought aboard the landship, something she wants to share to other people like her. 
Grey Throat Homecoming. Grey Throat's BOC depiction has her undergoing a rescue operation in Sugar City after being struck by a catastrophe, disregarding her camouflage with the conviction to protect and save lives. It's essentially a nod to her character development found in her files as well as in the main story. Adamant hatred and fear of the infected at first, but over the course of the Chernobyl Lugman crisis, witnessing firsthand the pain and suffering the infected go through, not only from the infected purge of Lugman and false sacrifice, but as well as the extreme dire situations that she witnessed the infected suffer through, just to live another day and protect their fellow infected she expressed in her archive files, it seriously changed her view on them, and it caused her to fight instead for their civil rights with her warming up the blade being a confirmation of this newfound conviction. So then, Greythoat's BOC skin is essentially something to fully top off her character arc, showing her as someone who fights for the infected, carrying on the legacy of those such as Faust, whom he gave his life so his fellow infected could survive. Indeed, as the flavor text of her skin states, disregarding protection or camouflage, Upon this outfit is etched the will to protect the next person, and save another life. Aurora, Polar Catcher In this one, she speaks to Magellan after she's made it to the peak of a summit in Sami. Notably, her team, funded by the Carlin Trade Company, being the only one out of the various other teams to actually make it to the top, telling Magellan that she's made it as part of her achievement. Part of Aurora's story has her being assigned as an assistant to Magellan to accompany her as part of her expeditions in the Infi Ice Fields. And in her operator record, it shows us Aurora embarking to the Sami Snowfield with Magellan for the first time, struggling against a snowstorm with her shield, but ultimately coming out without a scratch. If that's the case, then it's certainly a long way she went from being Magellan's assistant who would struggle against Sami's environment, but ultimately staying resilient throughout, to scaling the nation's summit without hassle, especially when the various other expedition teams have hardly made the journey. But then here's something that left me a bit confused. If Aurora was made Magellan's assistant, with her being shown accompanying her in one of her expeditions in her operator record, then why is there just zero mention of Aurora found in both the Black Forest Wills of Dream vignette and Expeditioner's Joculimaker stories. Unless, this is supposed to be reserved for a dedicated character arc for Aurora in a future dedicated Sami story, independent of the other two, as in a side story event, where she learns to overcome the challenges present within Sami, going from Magellan's apprentice to someone who can operate independently from her. Not to mention, we still don't know what the circular uncharted region above Sami and the ice field is, Something that is yet to be touched upon by either the vignette nor the roguelike stories. So perhaps, this new Sami based story featuring BOC Aurora will touch base upon this crater like region? Granted, it's a long trek from Sami to the ice fields to the uncharted region, but it would also be in line to the context given by Aurora's BOC skin. Someone who is resilient against the harsh tundra weather being able to accomplish something no other group sent by the various other nations of Terra could do. Heliger, Octopath Traveler Heliger is depicted back in his prime in the Ursus military, allied alongside Patriot's Guerrilla Shield Guard as well as another character. Specifically, this is Heliger during his time as a vanguard commander during the Blood Peak campaign, notably the same battle in which Heliger was forced to kill a close friend after the revelation that he was a Higashini's commander, deserting the army in the process. His files noting how, quote, he established a glowing military record, but then vanished without a trace. So possibly, this is the close ally that Heliger was forced to kill. As I mentioned with Shiwayuki, the Blood Peak campaign that Heliger participated in is the same war that forced Higashi into unity, and her BOC skin depicts her serving the southern court of Higashi before the Ursus military invaded the country with Heliger and Patriot in tow. So then, this therefore means that both Heliger and Shirayuki's BOC skins occur around the same time frame, and it's no coincidence that these two skins are released alongside each other in the same batch for Volume 2. So it's possible we may get a 2-in-1 package story featuring both the Higashi Civil War 
and the Blood Peak campaign at the same time. With Shirayuki and Helico respectively, while I doubt the two of them will interact with each other, appearing on both sides. Plus, it's very fitting for how similar the two characters are with each other. They serve their country's military with immense loyalty as high-ranking and deadly warriors, only to defect later on. Shirayuki was defeated by Fumizuki in a duel and gave her respect, joining her in Lugman as her bodyguard, only to later join Rhodes Island as part of a collaboration following Reunion's uprising in Chernobog and Lugman. Heliger was forced to murder his close ally due to his secret affiliation with Higashi, defecting and retiring, and along with his Oripathy infection, formed the Azazel Clinic in the process, then joined Rhodes Island once the events of the Chernobog and Lugman crisis unfolded with Reunion's uprising. It's so subtly done yet so brilliant to link these two countries and their history together in a way without explicitly telling us. Angelina, Distinguished Visitor We see that Angie is stationed at a second final defense front as, quote, the substance of reality flows between her fingers and her tools, talking to a captain that she's totally willing to handle the situation. This is a massive leap for Angie's character, because as far as we knew her, she was just a simple messenger from high school with oripathy and anti-gravity based arts, being able to manipulate the weight of an object. Not to mention, the upbeat and cheery personality present in her dialogue and expressions found in her E2 art in Summerskin have been replaced with something more serious and grim. It's like how Jessica's character arc took a massive leap for her as a character. But unlike Jessica, we don't know how Angie got from point A to B. Plus. Her files show us that she's nowhere near the disciplined professional soldier version of her that's displayed in her BOC skin, aside from maybe the lines in files 3 and 4 where they vaguely talk about her future. Having only just recently become a transporter, Angelina is full of hope for the future, much like other high schoolers. She spends much of her time studying or dressing up. She likes dainty jewelry and young adult novels, and hides a secret love for all the music. She could enjoy an ordinary, happy life. As a courier, an infected, or just a normal high schooler, Angelina works hard no matter what the future may look like. It wasn't until Rhodes Island found her that she knew there was another life for the infected. She is now a Rhodes Island operator, and she may be able to go back to school, probably. Where will the path Angelina has chosen take her? Even she can't imagine. Even so, it doesn't explicitly draw any connections from her files to her BOC skin. There is one thing to point out however, and it's how the skin itself resembles her appearance in Enfield. So the only possible explanation to this is that the skin itself is alluding to Enfield. Notably, Angie is the only returning character from Arcanites to make it into Enfield that isn't a knockoff version like Chen Changyu. However, she is not necessarily the same Angie we know, essentially being a clone of the original as she inherits the same memories of her original version. Enfield Angie is also non-infected and is 3 centimeters shorter than her original. Plus, the setting that Arcanite's Enfield takes place in, Talos 2, is a moon that is accessed through the door the giant portal present in the Sami ice fields. In Lone Trail, we are presented with the fact that Kalsa has been trying her hardest to open this door and cross the portal, but the collapsals pouring through it likely makes that near impossible. However, if Enfield is anything to go by, then that would mean that Cal did in fact succeed in crossing through the portal. With that in mind, then it's possible that Angie's BOC skin takes place in a battle to fight to reach the portal in what might be a last stand type of battle against the Collapsals, hence why it's called the second final defense front. Another thing to point out, the favorite text of her skin labels her gravitational based abilities as the substance of reality. We know that from her files that Angie has yet to have fully mastered her gravitational arts. So the result of her mastering these abilities will likely result in her being able to affect a warp reality in some way, given that gravity and space-time are directly linked to each other. As a matter of fact, Expeditioner's Yoklimaker contains an Expeditioner interview for Angie called Symmetria. In that interview, she continues her work as a messenger on an assignment to visit Sami, 
delivering a letter to a close Snopey's friend as changes begin to enact in the country. Now, aside from the fact that the story has no cohesive sense where she is just introduced and never further elaborated upon, or throws random sci-fi terms in your face expecting you to understand them, there are several key points presented that are to be taken away from it. 1. Angie can just use her R to straight up delete the collapsibles from existence like she has the GMO tool gun or something. Collapsibles are known to not be abiding by any laws of physics, being able to warp space and time to a degree. So an ability that directly influences space-time may as well be their Achilles heel. 2. Sami's ice heels are getting warmer and greener as the snow starts to melt, as well as the number of collapsibles present in the area being less significant. As a result, Sami ended up better than when we saw it. 3. Similarly, Syracuse is in a similar state of gradual change and reform into a better country, meaning that Vigil succeeded in his mission to bring about reform. 4. There were now established supply routes towards the giant portal. 5. A forgotten conversation from a long time ago suggests that Doc's race was conducting experiments involving Terra's solar system. With these pieces of information in mind, then it would signify that Angie's BOC skin takes place during a frantic battle after Angie mastered her arts during her time stationed in Sami, fighting a frantic battle against the Collapsals as a means of reaching the giant portal structure in the far north of the ice fields. Possibly, she would have a character arc where she learns to fully use her arts for combative purposes and gain confidence in them, hence the maturity in her expression present in the illustration, as well as the quote displaying full on confidence in herself and her powers with her mastering them being the breakthrough that those fighting the Collapsals need to turn the tides in battle and finally reach the portal. And as a result, her IS-4 expedition story would then take place as an epilogue after this final battle. The Collapsal threat has become insignificant as her numbers have drastically decreased, and Sami, as a result, has become far better than what it initially was. Much like the positive reforms in Syracuse thanks to the efforts of Vigil, Sami has started to undergo many changes that its people are accepting and embracing. Finally, the supply route established towards the portal megastructure being the setup for Enfield. It's possible that this is why Angie is the only character from Arknights to return, albeit indirectly, in Enfield. Given her potential achievements and victory against the Collapsals, provided by what we know she can do against them, then she would be absolutely hailed as a legend among the people of Sami as well as the Colombian expedition team surveying the ice fields, as well as why Enfield Angie resembles her original's BOC skin, as that's what Angie wore as she led the charge against the Collapsals. Now, as for why they would want to undergo the process of uploading her consciousness into a new vessel is unknown, and practically up in the air for speculation. We practically know nothing about Enfield lore as it stands, and apparently, any lore found in the technicals test was stated to be not canon. Not that it invalidates what I've said about Enfield Angie and her implications and connections to Arknight's Angie's BOC skin, but for the most part, it's likely they're gonna go back and refine what they have established for a later build of the game. My best guess as for why they cloned Angie has to do with how she basically wiped the floor against the Collapsals, like with how Gordon Freeman wiped the floor with the invading aliens from Zen at the Black Mesa incident and proceeded to do it again with the Combine. So possibly, they would want someone similar to fill in the shoes of someone like her as a super weapon to fight whatever alien threat is present on Talos 2. And what better way to do that than to literally replicate her? Calcit Remnant the anti arichnium communication lines have been activated. Signal received. Come in, Babel. This is Kaltzit. Exploring the former Lathanian region as planned. No coagulation point found as of yet. What about you, Doctor? What's the situation there? Kaltzit's skin is a huge one. For the sheer amount of lore implications and foreshadowing it gives us, not just through the flavor text, but also with the overhaul dialogue that the skin comes with. Now, I already warned about spoilers at the start, but because Kalsa is such an integral part to Arknight's story, this is where I really start diving into the big spoilers of the game's lore and story. For this skin, 
I will be going over spoilers, lore points, and revelations primarily found in Babel, and some spoilers for Chapter 14, Absolved There Will Be Seekers, as well as any additional information regarding the lore surrounding the Doctor and Calcit, such as Lone Trail. Let's start off with the skin's description. I'm Calcit, a Doctor of Rhodes Island, and also the companion of Amia and the Doctor. You have long been worthless to me. Originium has taken over the land, and what she envisioned has become a reality. She has enumerated and entrusted everything else to the others, leaving only her name as she hones her mission into a sharp blade. First off, the notion that Originium has taken over the land. At first, I thought it was just the Originium taking over Victoria as a result of Theresa's actions regarding the shard found in Chapter 14, especially when that giant tower in the background of the skin's artwork resembled the Shard of Londinium. It would also back up the Long Been Worthless quote, signifying a long and resentful relationship. As Cal is responsible for the most recent siege and destruction of Kasdel 200 years ago, plus he would have been worthless as an adversary to Cal in comparison to the relationship she had with Teresa. However, when Teresa activated the Shard, it painted the sky with a dark red hue, and the skin is depicted with a grey-blue tone. Plus, it also just does not align with additional information found in the skin that we will be going over in greater detail soon enough. Also, such a notion would also mean that Patriot's dying prophecy would be true, that the last of his kin would die at the hands of the Lord of Fiends, who would then doom Terra to a brutal end. His dying words as he confronted Amia were, I see cities devastated. I see Eugenium blanketing the land. I see you, black crown on your head, melting millions of lives into nothing but memories. I see the king of Sarkaz enslaving all peoples everywhere. So it seems the Originium covering Terra part of the prophecy is true. But what about the part of Amia being the harbinger of the calamity? In Chapter 13, The Whirlpool That Is Passion, 13-10 After Operation, we are presented with a premonition of Amia in the future, where she has fully given into her title and status as the Lord of Fiends, very similar to that of Skadi the Corrupting Heart fully giving into the blood of Primal Kyogre, where Sarkas like the Natsuru King of all people, bow before her as one of her many subordinates presented with the dark future that Patriot has exactly prophesied to her. All the nations of Terra have been annihilated. Once powerful nations like Laterano or Lethania have been reduced to ashes, with Amia contemplating if this is her doing. However, as the voices in her head provoke her to give in to this grim future, Amia ends up refusing the prophesied fate that leads the sarcasm down pain and destruction, choosing to defy it instead. Patriot's lifelong struggle, Dr. Kalsit's assiduous choices, the doctor holding my hand and affirming our path. All this just to become a footnote in Fate's manuscript? I refuse to accept it. So then, we can safely rule out Amia as the one responsible for the apocalypse scenario found in this skin. Besides, Cal still addresses Amia as one of her close allies and not as her enemy in the flavor text quote. There is one other candidate responsible for bringing out this apocalypse though, and one that would make sense for Cal to confront, to have an established relationship with prior, and for Cal to consider long been worthless. This is where the Babel spoilers pop up, as I will begin to go in depth regarding its lore revelations, so get ready. Just as a disclaimer, I will only be going over information presented in this story that is relevant enough to tie back to Calcis Bloodline of Combat skin, primarily regarding Originium. Any other information not important to the context of the skin will be skipped. Let's start with BB-ST-2. When Cal takes Teresa to wake Doc from their 13,000 year long slumber, they notably ask what the stage is on the Originium, to which Cal replies that, quote, it still grows on the continent outside, referring to the continent of Terra. 
Doc responds back that they woke up too early. Considering the sparse mountains of Originium we see around Terra, then it means that Doc not only finds that to be not good enough, but also signifies that their plan is to turn the entirety of Terra into one giant ball of Originium. Here's a few other lore bits to consider from this cutscene. 1. As the cutscene starts, we are presented with a conversation between Doc and Priestess that reveals to us that they were the ones who created the AMA-10 together, which is Cal's serial number thingy, effectively making them her parents, and establishing an implied relationship between her and Cal that wasn't previously elaborated upon or answered back when Doc asked her on whether or not she knew Priestess in the M8-8 afterstage cutscene. At most, it essentially means that Cal and Priestess are related. 2. As Cal opens the door to unseal Doc from their slumber, a dialogue with no origin of the speaker tells us the following. Originium will become the beacon, condensed by your civilization. If one day, other life forms in the universe lose their homeland and seek a way to resolve their plight, they will witness that we once shined, that we once resisted, and this is where we rest. We once delivered a gift to those who came after us, before our annihilation, hope. This seems to have been said by a member of Doc's civilization, whom I will henceforth call the Precursors for simplicity, as they address the possibility of a civilization that would emerge after them after being completely wiped out, with Originium being their beacon of hope. Referring back to a revelation found in Lone Trail, where the Precursors had suffered an extreme calamity beyond comprehension that nearly caused their extinction and the entirety of Terra to be severely damaged, in which the survivors ended up creating the Preserver Project with Friston as a result. Also, it's ironic for them to address Originium as a beacon of hope for the future civilization that emerged after them, when it's pretty apparent how much the material has done the complete opposite effect. 3. As Cal talks to Doc after they wake up, Cal reminds them of the question they asked her prior to going into stasis, just to make sure that Doc is still the same person that she remembers all those years ago. Doc tells her that it wasn't a question, but what they were looking forward to, for Cal to find the meaning of her life, to discover the meaning in the continuation of life, Cal indeed admits that is a path that she must keep walking. Based on her lore, Cal is someone who has roamed Terra since like, the dinosaurs roamed it. This colossal flyer went extinct 66 million years ago. So 66 million years ago? Soon. Bro, I swear I've seen this animal before though. She is someone who has been involved in the major historical events like the Knights of Morris conquest of the Fallen Hotlands and the recent destruction of Kasdale 200 years ago. Her involvement in history, as well as her role as the leader of Rhodes Island, reinforces this mission statement given to her by the Doctor, to find meaning in the continuation of life. Everything she's done was to ensure peace for Terra, taking on the best possible outcome for what she'll consider ideal for the world in the bigger picture, to ensure life can continue to exist. And this ties into the flavor text of her Bloodline of Combat skin. She hones her mission into a sharp blade. Seemingly, her lifelong mission to ensure peace and prosperity for the world concentrated into a single objective to stop this planetary threat that's not only responsible for coding the entirety of Terra into a ball of Originium, but also someone who has a close enough relationship to Cal for her to call them long been worthless. Now, I don't believe this culprit to be the Doctor, as they're mentioned alongside Amia as those Calcid deems those to be close allies to. Like with Amia, Doc is a red herring. I'll discuss who the real culprit to this is soon enough, but we'll get there when we get there. Right now, it is important that we prioritize all necessary lore jobs relevant enough to tie back into the skin, as that will give us a clear understanding of everything I will speculate on, and to additionally make sure we are on the same page. Moving on to BB-4 after Operation, there's this brief line from Doc when they're talking to Teresa about Aripathy and this new civilization they woke up to. Teresa recalls that Doc said that Originium did not develop in the way they expected, 
as they're in a desperate situation to cure Amiya's aripathy. Let's recall a conversation Doc had with Tristan back in Lone Trail, CW-ST-3, where Doc asks Tristan about who Priestess is and the nature of Originium. Tristan answers that Cal knows the answers, but Priestess, likely through some tinkering, forbids that she gives them. A restriction that is seriously engraved into her consciousness. In particular though, Friston mentions this. Oh yes, you have yet to even realize the contradiction of it all. So far, Rhodes Island has been working towards curing neuropathy and solving the problems of the infected. Though, you have also involved yourselves in outsider manners due to Kalsa and Teresa's ideals however. You, in the name of Rhodes Island, fight against Originium. This is the root of everything. I do not know what decisions Priestess made in the end, but it seems that Calcid, with all the lives born on this land with free will, has no way to peacefully coexist with Originium. Originium can benefit humanity, but it can also destroy everything. Just like the friendly creatures in the ocean and the endlessly expanding rift in the north. Priestess is the starting point of that madness, and you were once extremely close to her. The starting point of the madness. Essentially, it would mean that Priestess's dabbling caused Originium to take on a form that's more destructive, and something that Doc was not expecting to happen with the material, especially when this is someone that's claimed by Cal to be someone who knows the most of Originium. So this implies that Priestess has been fucking around with the funny black rocks without Doc looking. Fast forwarding to BB-6 after operation. We immediately start with Doc staring at the piece of Originium on the table, only to say to himself, Priestess, what have we done? So this indicates that Doc in fact had experimented with the material just as much as Priestess did, hence the use of we. We? Although, whatever Doc did to it probably wildly differs to what Priestess did to it. Backing up the notion of how Doc did not expect the material to take on a form a lot more destructive. In fact, later on in the cutscene, Doc mentions how Originium was just an energy project that the Precursors created with some safety measures in place, explaining why they cannot catch Aripathy. So what Doc and Priestess did in their experiments with Originium and the results ended up combining over the millennia that Doc spent in hibernation into the Originium we know now. Alternatively, Doc and Priestess both worked on Originium together, and what they created ended up evolving and mutating into something far more catastrophic. Something Doc resents for how much suffering they've seen it cause, both onto strangers and close friends like Amia. Later on in the cutscene, we start to see more internal monologues that essentially act as internal conflict for the Doctor, usually accompanied with one line presented in black and another presented in white. We were presented this internal dialogue in previous cutscenes, but this scene in particular is when they really start to become apparent. The text presented in black indicates a side of Doc that sides with the new civilization they awoke to with their attachment to Amia and their pursuit of finding a cure to her aripathy condition, being their anchor to the new world. The text presented in white shows the side of Doc who is still attached to their old civilization and the precursors, still hell-bent on their original goal of assimilating Terra with Originium. A new path is opening up, a path to self-destruction. I don't know if Originium is supposed to hurt a newborn civilization like this, but Originium is the only way to protect all life and existence. Foster a future with Originium, one that is peaceful, happy, and eternal. Originium will become the light that guides the next civilization. All consciousness shall foster new hope in Originium until the end of time. Originium must rewrite all. Only then, there is value in existence. It is not a transformation, but a death. It is not an extinction, but a continuation. I want to cure Amiya's aripathy. I want to change the present state of the Sarkaz. I want to walk among this civilization that I helped create. 
to take in the vitality of new life, something that we once had but have long since lost. Even if, even if everything that we see, all that we know, all that we cherish, no longer exists after a millennium. While the last bit of white dialogue contradicts the nature of the other ones, the idea is still there. It's essentially an angel and devil on the shoulder situation. But also, it shows how hellbent Doc is on their original plan to assimilate Terra through Originium. While the idea is sinister, the motivation is out of benevolence. They genuinely see the material as something that will guide them, their old society, as well as the new world order of Terra into the future. Especially considering that the Preserver Project was meant to foster the last remaining survivors of the Precursors after an intense calamity, then it's understandable to see where Doc is coming from. They're trying to protect the world from annihilation again, and Originium is the only solution they believe to be the best, despite the apparent downsides present right before them. Moving on, when Doc passes out on the deck and is taken to the infirmary, Teresa is informed by Cal by how much they appear to be torturing themselves by trying to get themselves infected as a means of finding a cure for Amia. It's then where Teresa decides to look into their mind. Fearing that Doc is clouded by an anxiety that they're not disclosing to anyone, not even Calcit nor Teresa. And when she uses Civilite Eterna to read Doc's mind, she finds this. Originium must rewrite all. Only then there is value in existence. From the emergence of intelligent life, to the lights in the cosmos and the maelstrom of the stars, Originium will continue to replicate and transform until even time ceases to exist. Originium, the first light before the Big Bang. She said that only by covering every inch of the land in Originium, only by returning manner and time, tide and wonder, light and wailing, to the vast ocean of information, only then will we find change and advancement and avert the fate that is the end, even though it is not a transformation, but a death. It is not an extinction, but a continuation. When was this memory, the doctor's emotion, pain, hesitation, and fear? Who was that, accompanying the doctor in despair? No, Calcet said there was another. The growth of Originium is silent, beautiful, calm, all signs of life have been overgrown. Civilization has vanished from this land, but Teresa feels only fear and suffocation. The memory is trembling, collapsing. There is a force somewhere, trying to fix an error. The Originium in the memory continues to grow, even assimilating Teresa's consciousness. She said that by only covering every inch of the land in Originium, so then, this is not Doc's plan to assimilate Terra, but likely Priestesses instead. This would suggest that Doc is simply someone sent to carry out this mission as the last surviving member of the Precursors out of an obligation to save their people. It's why Doc wrestles with these thoughts between saving the new civilization and bringing salvation to their own. They cannot have both. Priestess wants Terra assimilated by Originium, and only then will their people be saved. While Cal, Teresa, and everyone else in this new world want a way to mitigate Originium, find a cure for Oripathy, and stop the continent from being assimilated, neither party will accept compromise. Otherwise, either the precursors slowly die out and go extinct, or Amia will die of Oripathy. And the monologue about Originium without an origin speaker, back in BB-ST-2, is likely Doc's inner thoughts again, but not the internal conflict and clashing ideals. They're aware of their mission statement and obligation, but has become at war with the two possible solutions with no compromise. Plus, this is supported much earlier in the cutscene where they talk to themselves about what they ended up creating as they stare at the lone Originium Shard, 
likely having second thoughts about their plan to assimilate Terra after finding out the drastic negative outcomes that befell the civilization that rose after them. Anyways, when Teresa is pulled out of Doc's inner consciousness from Cal, she reports to her that she saw Doc's plan of Originium assimilating the continent of Terra, noting how they felt immense anxiety over it. It's then where Cal brings up the future of Terra brought about by Originium, how Doc told her of their ideal future that Teresa saw, and how it terrified her. Cal requests that Teresa uses Civilite Eterna to change the course of fate should she see an undesirable future, but Teresa reaffirms her. No, Cal said, that's not what I meant. The doctor's feelings towards Amia, towards us, toward you, are sincere. That is the truth. Trust the doctor and trust me. I will find the answer to what is tormenting the doctor. And when she is then cut off just as the doctor wakes up and does not speak on the subject any longer in this scene. Based on what Teresa comments on Doc's mental state, then it seems as if Doc is tormented by their attachment and obligation for the precursors. As I described, their commitment and mission statement the priestess and the others has been shaken up by choosing to spend time in the new Terra they woke up to, forming an attachment to it and its people in the process. Moving on to BB-7 before operation, we start with the doctor monologuing to themself again, lamenting the affirmation commitment to their goal, and it's here where we see their internal conflict in full display. While I slept, the ruins of our homeland nurtured new life. Originium is what guides their development, reshaping the lifeforms from Talos too to have a similar appearance to us. I am rather fortunate. I have been able to leap across the millennia to communicate with them. I have even considered myself one of the people of this land for a time, experiencing their past and future. But in the end, I am not of here. I have even begun to feel uneasy about Teresa's efforts. If the original project ends in failure, no. Even if it's merely postponed for some time, Teresa, Calcet, even the future that I promised to Amia, the inhabitants of this planet, some of the few life forms known to us, are but illusions that will break at the slightest touch. I have been lying to them and to myself for a very long time now, but how will I explain it to Calcet, or to Teresa, or to Amia? Am I supposed to tell them that all of the pain they've been through is the key to their salvation and that they must stop fighting? That all of Terran civilization is a fleeting dream and only by being assimilated into Originium will we have the opportunity to avert our fate? Seeing the lives of those they call the infected dissipate like smoke brings pain to my heart. It has long been the common sight on Terra, but it always marks the end of life, sorrowful and cruel. It has been too long since I've heard a voice full of life. I can't just see them as unexpected sparks. But what I see cannot be called a warrior's death. Rather, they have given in to the Originium's assimilation, passing through death to join the assimilated universe a chance where life can break through the deepest darkness. Should I bow in silence at their deaths? Or should I quietly rejoice at the smooth progression of the project? It is for this reason that Teresa dedicates herself to her research. Calcid, RAMA-10, has also chosen to believe in the potential of Terra, chosen to resist Originium and put an end to war. But what about me? The original project was built upon the efforts of countless generations. And in that time, billions of our compatriots have died. All in exchange for a mere 10,000 years that I have spent waiting and waiting. And now, the flint and tinder are in my hands. After all the long years, how could I abandon it? Because Terra has left me pleasantly surprised in a few short years, 
Because of the choices Teresa Calcent made, even if Amia has moved me to compassion, would I not have been the selfish one all along? They awakened me to be their salvation. But in truth, I am destined to bring them to annihilation. They awakened me, their destroyer, as if I were their savior. Amia, Calcet, what should I do? Priestess, what should I do? Perhaps I should reveal everything to Calcet and Teresa. Originium has led them down roughly the correct path. Arrogant though it may be, this has been sufficient for those souls to perform a new kind of miracle. Perhaps I must re-examine Teresa and Calcet's plan. Babel's research has proceeded faster than expected, but Terra's political structure is rather primitive, and Babel does not yet have the ability to transcend the barriers of race and nation so that it may represent Terra as a whole. Believe in Terra. Believe in the people to build their own future. Carry on with the project. At least the vestiges of those who came can live on within Originium. Believe in her. Stop her. Well, how could I ever blame you? I understand your dilemma. Our debates are far beyond what those little life forms known as humans could participate in. But this is the only way. You and I both know that much. If, perhaps, we still have time before its return, we can envision things together, achieve them together. Describe anything and everything within the boundaries of the universe together. I hope that in those fragile moments, you will always stand by my side. You will, won't you? As Doc wrestles with these conflicting convictions, they reveal to us several key things in return. Despite the suffering that Oripathy brings, Doc believes it to be the only way to salvation. At first, it sounds like Doc wants them to endure the suffering the material brings, as over time, their bodies will become null to it as they develop immunities to it. However, that's not how the immune system works, as it only fights against bacteria and other microorganisms like parasites and fungi. Originium is a rock, and oropathy is not technically a disease, and more like crystallization through cell assimilation. So then, what Doc is insinuating is that they need the infected to let oropathy consume them and allow themselves to become one with the assimilated universe. It's a harrowing and terrifying fate to consider, even cultish sounding too. But the way Doc describes it, it's like a necessary sacrifice in order to find salvation. And it's not like they're pulling this solution out of their ass either. Back in BB-ST-2, when Doc talks to Priestess, she notes how the stars are losing their color, and that the place they're in will fall silent soon. Essentially noting how the cosmos seemed to be dying, before requesting that Doc take a walk with her before the silence comes. In this cutscene, Priestess briefly mentions how she has time before IT returns. Remember that in Lone Trail, we are told that both the Preserver Project and the Star Pod that Kristen broke through were created in response to an unimaginable calamity that befell Terra. The Preserver Project was meant to shelter the last surviving population of the Precursors, while the Star Pod was created to protect them from this threat that nearly wiped them out. Jumping ahead, as of writing this, Chapter 14 is just around the corner to drop on Global. In Absolved, when Doc ends up having their entire being consumed by Originium, as a result of proximity to the Shard, now activated by Teresis, they enter an alternate dimension that is constructed entirely of their memories and innermost desires. In other words, all in the head. Creating what is essentially a good timeline Rose Island, where characters like Outcast and Ace are still alive and Frostnova and Talula are a part of the landship. Despite this being their ideal future where everything went out fine, Doc quickly dismisses it in anger and knows how much it spits in the face of everything they fought and sacrificed for. I could go into a bit more detail, 
but chapter 14 is barely out yet as I've mentioned. And while I've read the story back when it was still in the CN server, the machine translation is not perfectly accurate. So I can only operate on the vaguest idea I've got from that cutscene. Essentially though, this is the assimilated universe they mentioned back in Babel. Fristin backs this up in Lone Trail as he mentioned how Originium means unification. Originium means another state of existence. Like the ocean of Solaris, where everything exists within this order. We witnessed something very similar back in Dorothy's vision as well. Dorothy Franks wanted to create a utopia that was free of worldly conflict. While she had good intentions, the way she went about them was nothing short of unethical, frowned upon by everyone involved and everyone else who was there to witness it. The transmitters she created were linked to human consciousness and manipulated via Originium Arts, with those connected to the network acting as the casters, creating a collective consciousness and a dream world in which she witnesses her fellow colleagues as well as her experiment participants in this utopia where they're all happy and at peace. And while Dorothy realizes that this is the ideal dream world that she's been searching for, she also understands how unethical it is to force people to live in this utopia she's crafted for them. Essentially, Dorothy's vision is one to one in line with that of Doc's mission statement, directly down to motivation and execution. Tying this all back around to Doc's monologue in this cutscene, then it means that while the suffering and the death of the infected brings them immense heartache, in Doc's eyes, it is a necessary sacrifice they must make in order to join the assimilated universe as a means of salvation and protection against the everlasting threat that annihilated the precursors. Even if their project of assimilated Terra is going smoothly as they stated, they still have heavy doubts in their minds about it all. Because the people of Babel have caused them to develop compassion, especially Teresa and Amia. The radiating doubt of how, if their plan succeeds, then it also means losing the people close to them like those two. At the same time, sunk cost fallacy dictates that it must succeed. As they've put it, they've put in simply too much to just suddenly pull the plug on it. Some time after this, as Doc walks to Teresa to propose their plan to assassinate Teresa, disband Babel, and let their Originium project proceed without interruption, they return to the land ship to enact their plan and is about to disable the ship's defense system to let the assassins in. Before this happens, Teresa uses Civilite Eterna to look into Doc's emotions as she senses uneasiness in them, in which she finds this. I have reneged on my promise. I have betrayed she who waited within time herself. It is because of the love I felt. Love for life, love for existence. Love is eternally pure. It leaves me unthinking. Calcit, learn to love, learn to believe. You have to think. Go and lead. Go and face the rolling stones that fall down the hills, screaming as they go. But in the end, I believe that you can learn to love. It is internally pure. It is a child of every breathing creature. It is our nature. Go, Calcit. Go see your surroundings. Then see what lies by the most distant of mountains. Go seek what forms existence takes. I must go back. She had once taught me everything, once explored everything with fervor. But she has changed. She will not give me much time to act of my own accord. May we meet again next time. We will meet again, Calcit. I believe in them. I believe in you, Calcit. Calcit, I do not have much time left. Search for traces of life. Search for hope and the future. Calcit, go find your own answer. Find yourself. What we witnessed was Doc's former codename before adopting their current one. Fast forwarding to much later to the end of the story, Doc confirms this to be their original codename as Teresa explores their memories as she's erasing them. The Oracle. By definition, 
An oracle in ancient times was someone who offered advice or a prophecy that they believed to have originated from a divine source. This is normally done through a priest or a priestess. In modern times, an oracle is an individual who offers wise or authoritative decisions and opinions, or just a really good source of information. Whatever Doc's role among the precursors as the Oracle is unknown. But based on the definition and additional context we are presented with, we can take a stab at what their role might have been. Remember that Cal informed Teresa that there is no person more knowledgeable on Originium than Doc, backed up by how they would later lament the byproduct of their Originium experiments with Priestess, hinted by the use of what have we done, and not what have you done. So in a way, Doc is somewhat responsible for having a hand in the experiments involving Originium. However, Fristen would attribute the entirety of Originium to Priestess, suggesting that whatever involvement Doc had in the experiments is not significant enough for Fristen to mention that it was Doc and Priestess's fault for causing Originium to go out of hand. Plus, during the instances where we see Doc's internal monologue, the white text speaks a lot about how Originium will bring salvation. That by allowing oneself to become one with Originium and the assimilated universe, only then will they find peace and prosperity. They speak highly of the material, and hold it up in such a divine manner, speaking of it as if it's God. So then, Oracle's role among the precursors must have been this prophetic type figure, preaching and promoting their way of finding salvation and protection against the threat that continues to hunt them down among the cosmos, which is done to a single entity that is held up to such a high degree, the divine source in which they pass on their advice and prophecies. After all, Arcanites has a lot of religious and biblical theming present, we'll get to that part later, so it wouldn't be that much of a stretch to claim that Doc is Moses or Sans Undertale or something. Not to mention, Oracle and Priestess are the only two members of the Precursors that we actually see, and I mean in person so Fristen doesn't count, and they are commonly paired together in a close relationship. In other words, they are literally the Priest and the Priestess. <laughs> now, with all the excessive amount of yapping out of the way, we can finally move on and recontextualize Cal's skin based on the sheer amount of lore revelations presented to us from Babel. From the top again, I'm Calcet, a doctor of Rhodes Island, and also the companion of Amia and the Doctor. You have long been worthless to me. Originium has taken over the land, and what she envisioned has become a reality. She has enumerated and entrusted everything else to the others, leaving only her name as she hones her mission into a sharp blade. What Cal has envisioned becoming reality is the Oracle's plan of assimilating the entirety of Terra. Except, this isn't the result of Doc doing this, as we'll go over in a second, but the result of another force that facilitated it. As a result, Cal's mission statement that Doc gave her all those years ago is now in full force as she chooses to take on this threat herself leaving everyone else to take care of the current situation. Of course, this isn't where the lore drops surrounding this one skin stop. As I mentioned at the start of this entry, Cal's skin comes with her own unique dialogue with its own huge lore implications. For organization's sake, I will be going over the dialogue out of order based on what type of context is being presented here. Let's start off with going over the second talk line, as the information presented and implied is freshly relevant to what I just said we will be speculating on. Inactive Originium, solidified and accumulated, while redundant information piled atop itself in layers, giving us a new home. Only because you were there by our side, could we delay the awakening of the arrogant master of all creation. All those who survived rely on your aid. They are all very appreciative, and so am I. That part. The arrogant master of all creation. You've probably figured this out by now, but with what information I went over and the relevance of this skin, then all signs point to Priestess being the cause of reactivating and reviving the Oracle's plan. The nickname, 
the arrogant master of all creation that Cal labels her as, lines up with how Friston would cite Priestess as the catalyst of the madness surrounding Originium. Plus, it appears that she is deliberately hiding important stuff from us. When Doc asks Friston about Priestess, Friston notes how Cal is strictly forbidden by Priestess to disclose any information about herself, further establishing a hidden and undisclosed relationship between Cal and Priestess that is being kept hidden from Doc. And speaking of this relationship, then this explains the line, you have long been worthless in the quote. Whatever Priestess did with Cal, she regards it as worthless and insignificant in comparison to her relationship with Doc. Even if they betrayed her trust, and even when Teresa erased their memories, Cal still has a very distant and strained relationship with them. But regardless, Cal still regards Doc as a close companion to her, likely helped by this newfound character in post-amnesia Doc that Cal appreciates. So then, Priestess and Cal's relationship has always been cold and negative even from the start, as at least Doc back then had a close and positive relationship with Cal before they betrayed her trust. Cal and Priestess had next to nothing, hence you have long been worthless to me. And back to the arrogant master of creation part, we know that whatever Priestess did with Originium resulted in a catastrophic result that Doc was not aware about in the slightest, as it would have been held off for them in secret. Plus, if whatever she did with the material resulted in Cal calling her the arrogant master of creation, and for Fristen to cite her as the start of madness, then it would have likely been far more malevolent in comparison to Doc's motivations, a sinister ulterior motive she is hiding from everyone. Not to mention, we don't know whether or not Priestess is still alive. She may still be out there hiding. After all, who else has the ability and the knowledge to pull off something as drastic as assimilating Terra and Originium than the members of the Precursors, those who know about the material better than anyone else as they are the creators of it. Teresis and the Shard were only able to cover an entire city in Originium at best. No other character we've seen in-game was able to achieve this feat. So then, Priestess, likely witnessing that Doc had not only failed in their mission statement, but had also adopted an entirely new life goal and conviction post-amnesia, would have been infuriated at their failure and sought to do it herself, resulting in the Oracle's plan to finally manifest along with her reawakening. The awakening of the arrogant master of all creation only to be delayed by Doc's intervention. But despite their efforts, it's damn possible that Priestess will activate again and continue to proceed with the Oracle's plan. Also, bit of an ad-lib here. I literally just caught onto this detail as I was assembling all the recordings into one timeline, and I knew for a fact I could just not let this detail slip by. But basically, back in BB-7, when Doc talks to Cal as the Oracle in the memory, they mentioned how they not only betrayed she who waited within time herself, but also comments how this certain she will not allow them to act on their own accord. This paints a bigger picture regarding Priestess, someone who is seemingly pulling all of the strings in secret. A control freak who wishes for every piece, every pawn to proceed with her master plan, developing countermeasures to any potential factors that may end up deviating from her desired path such as programming Cal to prevent her from disclosing any information about her, as well as programming PRTS to not tell Doc the same thing, lest they end up revealing sensitive information that would otherwise jeopardize her entire plans. These countermeasures also include restricting Doc's autonomy, forcing them to let go of Cal, but not before providing her with her lifelong mission statement. And with all these pieces in place, all she can do is wait to wait within time itself, and allow her plan to unfold through Doc as her proxy. However, because Doc had not only gave up on her own mission statement as a result of Rhodes Island, but also, every last surviving member of the Precursors had pretty much died out, with Fristen shutting down the Preserver Project as Cal pushed all memories from him so he could be reborn in this new world. 
The same thing Teresa did to Doc, with both members abandoning all prior obligation to the precursors in the process. So basically, every piece that Priestess put into place with her plan has been completely void now. Doc and Friston abandoned their mission statement, as Cal is, in a way, responsible for sabotaging these plans. Priestess would be absolutely beyond furious that all of her plans and the survival of the Precursors had completely gone to shit. Because of these factors, she would be absolutely hell-bent on doing anything she can to revive the Oracle's plan in full force, just so everything can continue according to plan. The subtitle that Cal gives her has a double meaning. She's not just an arrogant master of creation, she's an arrogant master. A control freak, who's absolutely obsessed with her end goal, and will not tolerate any deviation or threats to her plans. Even if Doc and Cal ended up taking it all away from her, she will find a way to bring it back. She will do it herself. But regarding what Cal says in this next line, then it's a lot worse than what we're expecting. Originium soared through the skies and seized the twin moons, its clusters dispersing into the universe like spores, contacting and assimilating both the living and the dead. This is what's currently happening outside of Terra. Originium is swallowing everything into its body, and incubating an all-encompassing chaos. But Terra can still be saved. And only because you remain by our side. So then, whatever Priestess did or planned didn't just stop at Terra or the Oracle's goal. In her eyes, it's not just enough to just assimilate Terra unlike what Doc slash Oracle believed. As the material ended up assimilating the Twin Moons, just as it did with Terra, and is now dispersing itself out into the galaxy to speed up the process of assimilation. Remember what Doc said in one of their internal monologues back in Babel? Originium must rewrite all. Only then there is value in existence. So, Originium and Priestess's plan will not stop until pretty much every atom in the universe is assimilated and becomes one with the Utopian Collective Consciousness practically assimilating all of existence. While Doc's motivation for assimilating Tara was out of benevolence, the way the other characters talk about Priestess is highly likely she's doing this out of malice, like some sort of mad scientist, like Levi in Originium Dust, wanting to use the material to create the ultimate life form. And with what we've seen regarding the assimilated universe, and the Utopian Collective Consciousness nature of it, then Priestess likely wants to use the material to assimilate and completely rewrite reality, creating her own Utopian world in the process, essentially playing God. It's no wonder that Cal labels her as the arrogant master of all creation then. Not to mention, a conversation with Doc and Priestess back in Babel shows her calling humans, quote, those little lifeforms, as if she were placing herself on a higher plane, seeing them as lesser than her. It's as if Priestess has a god complex. Like, her name is literally of divine nature already, she might as well double down on it. Anyways, next voice line. With the originium held back by the curtains Rhodes Island has drawn, Mankind was able to build the Ark, and drag out its feeble existence. Yet the pressures of survival cannot suppress greed and desire. Every faction's leader yearns to become the administrator who holds all the keys. I understand that you pity them for their predicament, but you must decide based on your own judgment. The Ark does not have the resources to maintain unnecessary extended communications. But there will be no restrictions on transmissions between the two of us. Keep the channel open. The people of today may still remember what trees looked like. That is why they can point to Originium clusters and call them an Originium forest. But when we can no longer conceive of trees and woods, 
the word forest will forever disappear from our languages. If things continue that way, these lands will cease to exist as well. From the looks of things, the Rhodes Island landship is now being referred to as the Ark, with every corner of humanity flocking to it, seemingly to seek refuge from all the originium that surrounds them. Of course, this is in reference to Noah's Ark, where God sought to wipe out the sinful and unrighteous with a flood, but not before instructing Noah to build an Ark, and to board his family, as well as two of every animal on it, so that life has a chance to reflourish afterwards. The flood, in this case, is the flood of Originium. Granted, the idea that Rose Island represents Noah's Ark is nothing new. Prior, it was thought that the floods were represented by the catastrophes that prompted the use of nomadic cities. Of course, this skin, as well as Babel, recontextualized it to have the flood represented by the assimilation of Originium. It also retroactively explains why Arknights has a Kimono Mimi aesthetic. It's symbolic of all the animals Noah would board onto the Ark. By extension, Priestess would then be emblematic of God, sending a flood to Earth by activating something that would cause the entirety of Terra to be consumed. Hell, I literally just said she's playing God by doing this. Under the Curtain Weaver, symptoms of Aripathy have faded into history. Yet mankind continues to voice its dissatisfaction. The old order did collapse, but the minds of man remain narrow. Amia must still go hither and thither to unite them. While she is now an excellent leader, you are still the only one she can rely on. Notice how Cal uses the word curtain to talk about Originium in two of her voice lines, seemingly referring to a curtain weaver in this line. While I don't know any information, if there's any, to speculate on who or what the Curtain Weaver is, I will say this. Oripathy is no longer a serious condition as it was, and the status quo of Oripathy-based ableism is practically lost to time, but some resentment remains. This would imply that the Terrans are as immune to Originium infection just as much as Doc and the Precursors are. Of course, Doc couldn't manage to find a cure for Amia's Oripathy despite their desperate attempts and self-experiments. While a cure for Oripathy is far out of reach as of the current events of the game, and we know that from Doc's experiments that it's nigh impossible for them to conjure one up, there's one possible explanation as for why the Terrans have become nigh immune to this material. Referring back to Babel, Doc said in a recording that exposure to Originium is what molded the life forms of Talos II, which is the Ancients, to adopt a human appearance. So if exposure to Originium can mold their entire being, then will additional exposure to Originium further cause them to become immune? As Doc put it, if Originium transformed the Ancients into human-like beings, then there's a chance that a serum can be made as well. Granted, this is borderline weak speculation with not very concrete evidence, but I'll take what I can get in this analysis. There is one other thing, however. Oripathy no longer being a serious symptom as stated in Cal's skin lines up with what information we were presented with in Enfield. Taking place around the 17th Terran century, over five centuries after the events of Arknights, where Oripathy is no longer a terminal condition, Enfield takes place on Talos II, one of the moons of Talos. Another plan in the what the fuck mentioned in Lone Trail, accessed by the Terrans through the door. I think we know where this is heading by now. Like with Angie's skin, Cal's skin is foreshadowing to a story that will eventually lead up to Enfield. And regarding the circumstances of Cal's skin, then it would signify that Terra has become a lost cause and cannot be saved from the constantly assimilating Originium, forcing humanity to move on to Talos II. And while Originium Mouse exists on the planet, as indicated by some promotional art, it means, at the very least, that it's no longer a serious threat. And that's pretty much everything I have to say regarding Cal's bloodline of combat skin. Holy shit, what a mouthful. 
Granted, with how significant it was in its lore drops and her as a character, it practically felt inevitable that her segment would be the longest, as it gives much more to work with beyond flavor text. Anyways, let's move on. So that's all of the bloodline of combat skins that I could manage to go over. While I lack enough knowledge on certain aspects of the lore to properly speculate on ones like Chen the Holland or Gladius skins, I at least hope I was able to do these ones justice. Now granted, while the thesis of this theory is foreshadowing, there are a few characters whom I highly doubt will show up in future stories, but who knows, perhaps Greytho or Frostleaf will show up again in a future Columbia based story. Or perhaps, Orchid's BOC skin is actually the basis for her altar. Like, Hypergriff definitely plans ahead when making operators with open-ended lore. It happened when Reed and Bagpipe were released all the way back in Chapter 6, yet we're alluding to the events of Chapter 9 in their files and dialogue. And if we want to go way back, Siege's fourth archive file directly alludes to the general conflict found in the Ladinium arc, despite the fact that she was released all the way back during the game's launch. And with something like the Bloodline of Combat series directly alluding to future events, then I have no doubt for a second that Hypergriff is cooking regarding what will happen with these characters. Like, Ebenholz's BOC skin has the last part of the tagline quoted directly in ZT-ST-3. But even if Hypergriff does not have future stories in mind for all of these characters, then perhaps we could settle on something like a Bloodline of Combat event that would portray certain characters whose skins are not very significant enough to be featured in a dedicated story. Perhaps a vignette event where we tap into the lives of characters like Eunectus or Flint in their peaks. Or maybe glimpsing into Greytho and what she is like after completing her character journey. Also, I just want to say, without a doubt, Arcanites present its lore in a jigsaw puzzle manner. Information is scattered about across various stories independent of each other that you would have to connect the dots on. And not gonna lie, actively researching and looking into these stories for entries such as Beagle, Angelina, and especially Calcit, connecting all these threads and tying them back around to their skins made me feel like a fucking glowing brain genius. As with what was established through Magic the Gathering, a Vorthos player appreciates the interconnectedness of the lore found in each set. In the sense of Arknights, a Vorthos player like me appreciates the interconnectedness of the lore found throughout the game through events and flavor texts found in things like modules and skins. In this case, the Bloodline of Combat series is a cumulative cap for the Vorthos players who follow these operators across their many stories and appearances, prompting them to fill in the lore jigsaw puzzles presented before them in the skin line, leaving them to wonder what is next. Predicting where the story is going and imagining the potential of Terra is what makes Arcanites great. And for me, doing this felt like I was making some revolutionary breakthrough that will forever change the world, as literally nobody else is proactively doing this. Many previous creators have tried to step up to be the voice for lore discussion among the Arcanites community. Unfortunately, they've all come and gone. Now, I could go into a big sentimental speech right now, but I want to reserve that for the end of the Horn Analysis essay. All I will say right now is this. I will without a doubt continue to make more Arcanites lore analysis stuff beyond just this and a very ambitious analysis on Horn. At the same time, as much as I want to step up to be the prominent creator for Arknight's lore discussion for the EN community, I also want to inspire people to do the same thing, and especially for this video. I hope that my analysis of this will encourage you to pick up on the aspects that I did not touch on and form your own analysis and theory videos, especially when a whole new batch of Bloodline of Combat skins has just recently dropped as of recording this line. That's my mission statement. That's all I'm gonna say for now. I hope you all enjoyed my ramblings. I will see you all in my next Arcanite's lore analysis and discussion video.